the next major weirdness was that it came by the sun at closest approach on 9-11. Now, that's bizarre. Yeah. I mean, you can that's... calculate literally that that unique date, which everybody now acknowledges is, is, is a first in certainly modern history and maybe in all history, uh, it even overtakes Pearl Harbor now as the sneak attack of sneak attacks. Historically, to have this event coincide with that date just by chance is one in 365. In other words, pick any date of the year that this thing could come by closest to the sun. But it didn't pick any date. It's on October, I'm sorry, September 11th. And that date in the physics, if you go back and read my analysis of 9-11, was in fact chosen for a very important set of hyperdimensional reasons having to do with manipulating public fear and concern in 2001, on September 11th of 2001. The next date, the next thing that makes you sit up and take notice is that it's coming by the Earth, closest approach to the Earth on the evening of October 16th. At 19 hours, 50 minutes, Greenwich Mean Time, 22 million miles away. And 19.5, of course, is again a redundancy of that same number. The inclination of Elenine's orbit to 360 degrees, in other words, it can come in at any angle. If you take a reference, let's say you take the north side of the galaxy as a reference, it can come in any angle relative to that reference point, which is 360 degrees. So you take 360 and divide it by the 1.84 degree inclination to the Earth's orbit, which is your, your starting point, and that result is 195, another 19.5, and on and on and on. There are some other indications now of major physical constants to physics that we found in the ephemeris, meaning the trajectory of Elenine, but they're still tentative. I'm still working to make sure that they're not just accidents of, of the mathematics, but they're real. But, and my criteria for real is they have to appear more than once. And in this case, I've just found out they appear more than once. So, And there are some other coincidences that are pretty bizarre that I'm going to be talking about at Awake and Aware on the 24th, yeah, the 24th of September in a little less than two weeks. So all in all, it's for this reason, these reasons that I say this thing has got to be artificial. Then, on the 19th, it popped out in response to a CME, a tetrahedral shield. Well, a tetrahedron and a sphere gives you 19.5 degrees at each of the touch points in the northern and southern hemisphere of a rotating hypersphere. So mm -hmm. you look at the string of coincidences around a specific, incredibly meaningful set of mathematics which are, are code for hyperdimensional physics, and the message of Elanine is this physics. We're on our way to demonstrate, to use, or show you how you can use this physics. Stay tuned. So whoever said it to us has got to be, in my book, good guys. Okay. Now, what, uh, well, you know, the, the really good point of all of this is we're not going to have to wait too long to find out if any of this is true, right? Oh, horrors, he would have to wait. Gosh, Jim, when do we all get so impatient? Hey, listen, you know, I, I pray every night for God to give me patience, and I say, right now. I want it right now. <laughs> <laughs> Look, we only have a few more weeks. Right now, Elanine is invisible, uh, I think, to any observatory on Earth because it's too close to the sun, and the angle between sunset and it is still now too close. So <clears throat> if you try to expose for a dim object particularly if it's, if it's not emitting gas anymore, it will get dimmer and dimmer and dimmer. doesn't mean it's not physically still there, boys and girls. It just means we can't see it. Right. You know, Jim, way back years ago when I was working for Cronkite on Apollo 8, I had this really neat idea. What if we could borrow? I mean, I was with the network, right? I, I, my, my ego and my ambitions knew no bounds. I worked for Walter Cronkite, and I thought, heck, why can't I find a telescope where we can actually televise the Apollo 8 spacecraft going to the moon live. See an actual human-occupied spacecraft leaving the Earth, going to the moon, going into little orbit. And so I went looking, and I was actually given leads, very solid leads for some very technically bright people. And they ultimately wound up leading a team of CBS technicians, including our executive producer, to this little observatory south of me now here in New Mexico, down near 
place called Cloudcroft, which had all kinds of super-duper electronic amplification, the most sophisticated observatory on the planet. And I got it as a scoop for CBS News. So we hooked everything up. We hooked up the cameras. We hooked up the landlines. In those days, no satellites. They had to be AT&T. Mm -hmm. Back to New York, got all ready, pointed the telescope at where Apollo 8 was and saw nothing and kept seeing nothing all the way to it in little orbit. You can imagine how my folks took to this at CBS News. Here was this young hotshot, this not dry behind the ears guy who knew everything and claimed that he could photograph the spacecraft going to the moon and you'll see a thing on the damn TV screen. Well, it was just too damn dim. And it was right next door. It was less than 100,000 miles out when we were trying this. What we did see were the venting of hydrogen and oxygen, water, from the tanks of the S-4B, the upper stage rocket, which had been used mm -hmm. to shove Apollo 8 into its final escape trajectory into lunar orbit. And that showed up like huge ejections of gas. It streamed like a comet across space. We got wonderful photographs of an inanimate object, a rocket <laughs> that, was, that was venting water vapor and couldn't see a thing of the spacecraft that was not venting water vapor, i.e. the Apollo 8 spacecraft, which, by the way, later we did pick up when they it had what they call the urine dumps, when they would dump water over overboards out through vents. Uh -huh. You would see that for an hour or so as a cloud of ice crystals around the spacecraft until it dissipated and sublimed, evaporated in a vacuum, and then became invisible again. But you couldn't see the object. So, no, if there's a spaceship inside this thing called Elenine, our, our language, you're not going to see it unless it bent something, unless it spews something into space. If the whole purpose of looking like a mimic comet, looking like an artificial comet, was to be seen, to be picked up at 19.5 magnitude, way, way out there, halfway to Jupiter's orbit, then it fulfilled that part of the mission. The whole world on the Internet is talking about it, even if the mainstream haven't been given a clue yet to go look. I mean, can you imagine, Jim, what's going to happen when there's one major story on CNN or Fox or ABC? Alanine is coming, and it might be a, a Death Star or something. People will run like lemmings to the Internet. They'll Google frantically, what are they going to find? Already prepackaged for them. Every conceivable lie and outrageous boast about Alanine and its doing in the Earth that they could possibly find all in one place, all on the Internet at YouTube. Careful of preposition. That, I think, is the other side's <clears throat> strategy to try to, <clears throat> excuse me, prevent the positive message of Elanine from getting through. A whole bunch of very scared, frightened human beings looking up and saying, oh, my God, the sky is falling. Yeah, and all it's going to take is one story like that, and then the rest of the media uh, will fall into what I call magpie you journalism. You know, what, you know you, the magpies sit on the fence you chunk rocks at them, and they just sit there, but you let one of them fly off, and all of them go. Yep. Now, and that's what I they're going to do. I believe this will all be carefully timed. It's going to wait until just before Elanine will become visible again to just ordinary folks, just standing out in their backyard. <clears throat> if I'm right, Elanine itself could do something really spectacular. It could and become, that, will, that, that will be when? About that October will be when, the, a, that October. will be the first week in October or the second week as it comes up on closest approach on the 16th of October. Okay. All right. So you'll, so look, first... you'll stand east, you'll look in the constellation of Leo before dawn, hour, two hours before dawn, and it will be there tracking across Leo. And if I'm right, at that time as it passes Regulus, which is the brightest star in the constellation of Leo the Lion, which gets into a whole bunch of symbolic stuff about the ancient origins of humanity, Jim. Yeah. You really got to come and see what I'm going to talk about in uh, in Los Angeles because it's, it's interesting. It, it, it's a lu it's an absolute Lulu, pun intended. Anyway, that would be the time to release the hounds, to release yeah. the fear porn, to get people looking at this thing who would normally go, "Oh wow," to have instead go, "Oh, ah, it's falling." That kind of nonsense. Mm -hmm. Well, if I was writing the script. Let, let let me throw this at you because you know uh, as you were saying I think this is this is a uh, operation the secret space program the the Nazification of America which I wrote about in the rise of the Fourth Reich uh, this really goes way back there let me give you this quote from uh, 
Lyndon Johnson, okay, uh, he was as Senator Lyndon Johnson speaking to the Senate Democratic Caucus. He says, quote, control of space means control of the world. From space, the masters of infinity would have the power to control the Earth's weather, to cause drought and flood, to change the tides and raise the level of the sea, to divert the Gulf Stream and change the climate to frigid. This is the ultimate position, the position of total control over the Earth that lies somewhere in outer space, end quote. And he said that in 1958. Mm. Now, what do you suppose he meant by the masters of infinity? Because he was in, he was on the in crowd. He knew what. Remember, you asked me who, which politicians knew. Yeah, he's Johnson one of them. definitely knew. Yeah, and that's why he was so interested, because he knew it was the determination of human history on Earth, what right. was coming, what was being planned. And remember how Kennedy tried to give the the results of this extraordinary exploration of the moon in person, Apollo. He tried to give it to the Russians, to the Soviets, so we'd do it together. That's right. And in Dark Mission, I argue with Mike, you know, Mike Barra, that that was the reason he got killed. It was it was the final straw. And there's this wink, this the incredible photograph of the wink between him on Air Force One after he's taken the oath, and the head of the uh, Republican committee in the Congress that oversaw NASA's funding. Mm-hmm. And they're winking to each other. Yep. Yeah, well, I mean, Kennedy, you can't get any, were, any more, you can't get clearer than that. Now, of course, we've got the mainstream beginning to listen, and I've not had a chance to hear them. Have you, Jim, uh, uh, Jackie's tapes where she talks about Lyndon Johnson as the <laughs> man who killed her husband? Well, yeah, it's, it's, you know, this is the limited hangout. They're going to keep dribbling this out until about another 10 or 20 years. Everybody's oh, no, no, we just don't have say, 10 or 20 years. Uh, no, no that's true. we don't have 10 or 20. Yeah, I'm true. fascinated because this is the <laughs> first official break in the wall that Johnson was a do, do-gooder, good old boy from South Texas who just had no. a, a rough way for doing really cool things. No, 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 this no. This is no. a break in the wall. Anybody that lived in Texas long enough knew what a but murderous nobody lives in Texas was. Except you guys. Uh, yeah, well, that's true. And they won't listen to us anyway. I'm trying to tell them right now, don't trust Rick Perry, but nobody Are wants you to listen kidding? to that. Nobody yeah, wants to talk about that. that hat and the saddle. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Well, listen, we're getting off off topic here. Let's let's talk about what the world might be like if we suddenly realize that they we're not alone in the cosmos, and if we can suddenly wake up and throw off the shackles of these Nazi super controllers, the Uber controllers. Then uh, you know we could use the technology that is off the shelf today, uh, and we could power the world. Everyone could have power. Everybody See, could have cool clean part. water. Jim, you, know? you just put your finger on it. You just you just said the magic word. Duck will come down and pay a thousand dollars. You said off the shelf. We yeah. don't have to start at ground zero. It's not like okay, we let the world know this physics and technology is possible. And then we have to spend a lifetime figuring out how to make it work even to heat water. No. We no. bought and paid for it. It's sitting on shelves and on runways and in underground hangars all over the damn planet. All we have to do is break it out of its prison and put it to use, saving 7 billion people who are killing the world just by living on it. Mm-hmm. So the world, I'm forecasting, if this is the beginning of that process, it, it, it knows no boundaries. This is the most incredible time to be alive. It's what everybody hoped would happen. Yeah, and and could not even imagine how it would happen, and that's why again I think all this orchestrated fear porn against Elanine because somehow Elanine is the trigger. We have to do the hard heavy lifting, but Elanine is somehow the trigger to unleash this pent up store of energy, psychically and metaphorically and and realistically that has been sitting there just waiting to be put to use for the benefit of all mankind, as those plaques said when we went to the moon. Well, these people who want to control the world, one of the big weapons they use, one of the big uh, uh, sticks they use over their minions is that the – and I've heard uh, everyone from Maxwell Taylor uh, all the way up to uh, uh, David Rockefeller, Henry Kissinger, they say the basic problem in the world today is overpopulation. 
and said, uh, you know, we've just got to cut the human population. And in their in their world, they'd like to see about two thirds of the world population go away, and the other yep. third wait on them. Okay, but yep. now let me tell you something. Let me now think about this. I heard this and I couldn't believe it, but it's true. The average living space today in Hong Kong, and think about Hong Kong, got everybody crammed in this little island place there, and they've got all these huge high rises where everybody's crammed in these apartments. But the average living space is 1,700 square feet. That's not a bad size apartment. Okay, I live in a lot smaller apartments than that. Okay, yeah. based on based on 1,700 square feet, the whole population of the world, 6.8 billion of us, could all live comfortably enough just in the state of Texas. Isn't now, that amazing? Now, don't come, anybody. Stay where you are. <laughs> okay, I, I don't want you piling in here. But <laughs> and and but believe me, all you gotta do is try to drive through West Texas sometime, and you can drive for eight or nine hours and never get anywhere. Okay, and never get out of state. Uh, yep. Almost, depending on which way you want to go. Now, so there's really not an overpopulation problem. It's a problem. It's a population concentration problem. Everybody's jammed in these big cities, and uh, that is primarily well, probably see, so, they, the so key, they get energy the, to them. One of the coolest things is once you crack the secret of hyperdimensional torsion field energy production. Yeah, you can basically power a home with a unit the size of a bread box put in the basement. Yep. You don't need to be on the grid. The home doesn't have to be anywhere near a city. Obviously, people want to have communities, so you have much smaller communities. People don't commute. They work locally. They work with the Internet. You know, you do manufacturing with robotic technology. You, you, you hire people with brains. You put them through college so they have brains right. and can follow creative, you know, free time activities, you know, art, sciences, curiosity, entertainment. They can live as human beings. It all depends on freeing these technologies, which That's right. also include medical technologies. That's you know, it's right. like it's like two percent now on Medicaid is what's running up the huge bill on Medicaid. Ninety nine, ninety eight percent are fine. It's those two percent where you have to use extraordinary means to keep them alive: respirators and lung machines and and all kinds of twenty four hour care. And obviously, those are the people they're talking about. Do you want to kill grandma? No, you want to fix grandma. This yeah. technology allows you to fix grandma, so grandma gets out of the hospital, goes back home to her own home, lives an independent life, and one day, if we don't fix the ultimate problem, she keels over, but there's no long malingering illnesses anymore, including cancer. Right. It changes and everything for the better, and somebody yeah. is fighting tooth and nail to keep it from happening, and that's why the silly fear porn is being spread all over, so that instead of being receptive to a real new age, when the physics will make it possible... We will enter it fearfully. As right. FDR said, the only thing we really have to fear is fear itself. Itself, exactly. And that's all we really have to fear because, uh, uh, you know, unless, unless something comes from outside, some asteroid, and blows the world apart, it's, we're here, and we're in but the see, soup, that's also and we, we need to take porn. care of it. Yeah. But see, that's also more fear porn. Look, well, that's back. We, we are we are now tracking all these objects that might wander by. So far, nothing has been found except one out of thousands and thousands. That one is going to encounter the planet in twenty thirty six, maybe in a bad way. It's only two thousand eleven. By twenty thirty six, if we had a halfway decent space program, that problem becomes a non problem. It is the one uh, global catastrophic changing event in all of human history, where we currently, with current science and technology, have enough knowledge to avert the catastrophe. Nothing right. else gives you warning. Hurricanes, earthquakes, whatever. Asteroids coming at you give you warnings, provided you have a decent space program. That's why we got to have a decent space program. If for nothing and, else, and what are we doing? That could yeah, it. and what are, what are we doing? We're we're basically shutting down the space program because either we've been threatened, blackmailed. That's one scenario, yeah. or yeah. We're on the verge of such a leap forward that where we're going, we don't need roads or rockets. 
<laughs> well, I, I think it might be a little bit of both. And I, I do think that we've been threatened and warned off just like uh, Operation High Jump, 1947, right? Yep. Sent, a, sent a whole fleet down to Antarctica, and they all came running back with their tail between their legs. And, Boy, is and, there a story uh, and, there, Jim. There's a wouldn't hell of a story there. You, as, as an award-winning journalist, wouldn't you just give your eye teeth to dig into that story and be able to write the real history of That's uh, right. High Jump and Whitney Yep. 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 And, uh, By the way, do you know do you know this guy Russ Baker? Uh, not personally, but I know who you're talking about. Wrote yeah, he really was on good post on last night. He was on yeah. post last night with the substitute host Wells, John Wells, and they were talking a great deal about uh, 9/11. It's obviously they need to know about Judy Wood's work because yeah. without that missing puzzle piece, you'll never figure out what happened, and more important, who made it happen. Well, all right, for those listening and you're wondering what in the heck is this all about, uh, I don't want to get into the long thing about 9-11, but we've just been inundated here over the past weekend and yesterday with all these memorials and all the mainstream hoorah about 9-11. I just want to leave you with a couple of things. Number one is the senior counsel to the official 9-11 commission, John Farmer, uh, in a book called uh, Ground Truth, on page two, right off the bat, says that the account that was given to the 9-11 Commission and hence the Congress, the media, and the public is, quote, almost entirely and inexplicably untrue, end quote. Wow. Now, that's the senior counsel to the 9-11 Commission. He says and the why story... why is this the New York Times headline? Well, because the New York Times is part of the problem. Okay? Why isn't it now, part of the Huffington Post? Well, the, good question. I guess you have to go talk to Huffington, but the uh, but the second thing, uh, and then all of the all of the uh, Keene Hamilton, the the commissioners themselves have said, well, we were lied to. Max Cleland, you know, was raising Kane until Bush gave him a cushy position on the International Monetary Fund, and he resigned and left. He said, this is a fraud, you know. But see, nobody wants to listen to them because they're not conspiracy theorists and easy to brush off. Now, the second thing is, uh, to the World Trade Centers, um, one, of the, one of the most durable products that humans make is a toilet, <laughs> right? I mean, you know, you know, you go to a junkyard, and there they are. The toilets don't go away, and they don't well, break apart. Do you want to hear apart. something interesting, Jim? Well, wait, well, let toilets me finish. Are my... made, toilets are made of steel and porcelain, right? They have a steel core. Right. Yeah, and a porcelain with outside. Porcelain. Yeah. Did you know that our first space telescope was covered with porcelain for exactly the same reasons? Because it's indestructible. It's indestructible. It resists radiation. It doesn't uh, expand or contract at variance with the steel. It's basically the best impermeable material that will last for millions of years if left alone, even on Earth now. So, okay. So let me ask you this. Home. Here, here, my question to you is this then. When you've got 110 stories and every floor has multiple bathrooms and you've got thousands of toilets, where are the toilets in the, the debris? There were none. There were none. What, what has there were no the filing cabinets. There were no, no walls. There were no, I mean, there no. is an aerial photograph that was released yesterday from the uh, New York Police Department, the aviation unit, by, and I'll pop it up here on the screen, by a detective, uh, let's see what his name is, Greg uh, Samarin, S -S 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 S -E -M -E -N -D -I -N -G -E -R. It is showing Building 2, Tower 2, in the process of collapse. And what it's showing is something which is literally turning the steel and that upper part which tipped sideways before the whole right. thing came down, right. it's, yeah. it's showing it f turning to dust as it's falling toward the ground. It's disintegrating, and this photograph, never released from the helicopter, sitting up top looking down on it at a very steep angle, never seen before, shows clearly the tower is disintegrating. It's not collapsing. No. This one no photograph plan. proves Wood's hypothesis and gives lie to the entire 9-11 commission report. We need a new commission. We need Amen. a new study. We need a new investigation. Part and of which this, may come out one, of what's coming. 
And this one, a new, a new investigation should not be centered in Washington, D.C. No one connected to the federal government should be part of it. So they should get a cross-section of, uh, of experts from across the country, from small colleges, from major colleges, academic police officials, fire officials, and even a smattering of just smart people from off the street and have a citizens commission that would actually investigate that crime rather than handpick political cronies who act as gatekeepers. Well, if I'm right, <clears throat> if, if the sea is changing, that is going to happen. I don't know when, but it will happen, and it will be another part of the paradigm shift, because if you can imagine anything more shocking to most Americans but to find that they've been lied about 9-11, right. that would do it, wouldn't it? It that certainly would. That would them over the edge. Well, it should because 9-11 has been used as the hammer to mold us into the society based on fear and hatred and war that we have right now. Uh, everything, the, problem every, every, that I have, the problem I have, Jim, with 9-11, of course, is the downside. We see in what they did 10 years ago the awesome ability, this power, this technology, this physics to literally turn matter into dust. Right. And that technology is in someone's hands. What I am shocked about is the whole 9-11 truth movement. Instead of looking at this data, looking at, at Wood's objective analysis and presentation of empirical evidence, which just keeps getting stronger and stronger, instead of looking at all that, they're, 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 they're barking at the wind about thermite and controlled demolition and all that nonsense when the physics itself means there's a set of bad guys out there who destroyed well, 3,000 3, Americans on an afternoon, uh, you know, 10 years ago, who obviously also probably used it on the Pentagon and on whatever happened in Shanksville, and are using it again in ways that are much more subtle as part of this escalating secret war, and no one here is supposed to know it's even going on because it's all been covered up under the so-called 10-year war on terrorism against al-Qaeda, which in my mind is a cover for the real war and has been for the last decade. That's true. It's, it's a sub rosa war. Well, I'll tell you what, the, the only, like I said, one of the only uh, real bright spots, well, two bright spots, number one, if, if your hypothesis is correct and if uh, we do have a big wake-up call here, uh, then maybe it will usher in a whole new uh, era of peace, tranquility, and maybe we can shake off these uh, the warmongers and the corrupt bankers and the everything else that's causing us such a problem. And the second thing is that's a big uh, uptick is that uh, if all this is going to happen in the next several weeks, we don't have a whole long time to have to wait for it. <laughs> no, <laughs> Richard, Ri Richard Hoagland, it's been great having you on here. This has been one heck of a discussion. I think we're going to we're gonna have to continue this at some future date. And um, so for right now, we're going to call it a night here at uh, Epic Voyagers. And uh, this is your permanent uh, moving transient host, <laughs> semi-host, uh, Jim Mars, uh, wishing you a really, really happy evening and a good tomorrow. And we'll see you later. Adios. Thank you for being with us tonight. Please join us again next Monday evening for Extraordinary Phenomena Investigations Council's Epic Voyages. I'm Roger Peacock for Epic. Until next time. You say.